Meet Marnie Hughes Warrington, historiographer at the Australian National University. Now, Marnie has written several books. Here are two of them, 50 Key Thinkers on History and World Histories. So she's all about trying to understand how history is written, how we understand our own history. Here are two more books, History Goes to the Movies and How Good a Historian Shall I Be? And I sat down with her, actually we stood up for about an hour as I talked to her about history, how humans became humans, and about the question, are we alone? There seems to be a scientific search for understanding how we got here. Mm -hmm. And uh, is that, I mean, are we alone is part of that. And do you think, well, is that important? This oh, science? absolutely. Why? I mean, the, Why? The kind of philosophy that I do is called metaphysics. Uh, and it's a branch of, it's a very ancient branch of philosophy which tries to make sense of things. So what are the kind of ground rules for being who we are, how we make sense of the world? And history is just one part of that, for instance, or what we think a life form is. I actually think these are probably the most important questions people can ask because it, it leads to us thinking about our world in particular ways and treating one another differently. So I do think it's critical. <clears throat> but you know a large fraction of the people on this planet don't agree with you. Oh, that's completely fine, but my job <laughs> as a philosopher is never to run with the crowd and always to ask deep questions. So let's suppose that I'm a member of that crowd and I don't think this is an important question. Can you convince me in a minute? Sure. So um, the way that you think about me um, can determine whether you treat me fairly or unfairly. Right? Now, I might be a human being and you might treat me fairly or unfairly because of the rules that you have about treating me. I could actually be a single cell organism and you might treat me fairly or unfairly as well. So, Fairly. Yeah, take an example. So there's ethics mm. approval processes for lots of research that people do. And people discriminate between organisms that have spinal cords and organisms that don't have spinal they cords. They sure do. Right, so why do they do that? Well, and genetic proximity? Possibly. Um, Get another example? We got another complexity. Complexity. It could it. be. Uh, it could be that there's particular families that they're interested in, which is not necessarily about proximity, but you know, some notion of heritage. Now, is that fair? So what I'm trying to get you to think about is whether the rules that we've drawn up there are actually right. Let's talk about complexity in a general sense. A lot of people think that over the past four billion years, or even longer in, in the universe, that life, is, uh, life gets more complex as it evolves. Do you think there's anything, do you agree with that? Oh, look, I th certainly think that is the case. If you look at patterns, there is more complexity. But, um, Can you give an example of more complexity? Ah, oh, well, look, language use and sophisticated communication styles and use of technologies to support enhanced extended. So people talk about extended minds. So human beings have invented computers because they can't store it all up here, for instance. Um, or so we're more complex than we were 10,000 yes. years ago. Yes, because we've, we've figured out a way of actually extending our mind function in lots of interesting ways. We're bipedal. We weren't that before. So there are some things that are different and probably more complex about us than were before. It's interesting, as somebody who works on what histories are and what people think they're for, some people think it is a story of complexity. Other people think it's a story about entropy. Um, other people think it's, it's predominantly a story around social learning and collective learning. Other people think it's a, it's a story of, of, you know, essentially the sun's just going to come and eat us up. Charlie, the interesting thing is that people have different views about how that story should be told. I want to get back to this question of ethics, because I asked you about ethics and you talked about uh, guns, germs, and steel. You've, you've read this mm, book. Guns yes, absolutely. Guns. All right, so, and you talked about germs. But let's yep. just forget about the germs for a second. And you want to talk about the guns. <laughs> no, no, let's talk about ethics, about, uh, about being colonized, about what Stephen J. I mean, um, Stephen Hawking, I don't think, was afraid of germs from aliens. He was afraid mm. of just being treated like we treat amoebas. Yep. So do you think there's anything at all universal about what is often referred to as ethics in a social species called humans? I actually think this is one of the most important questions, that, and I'm really, really interested in this question. At the moment, the guides we've got to ethics are really very predominantly focused on human to human, so individual to individual ethics, and the, the way in which we talk about ethics is predominantly set around scenarios of that kind. Should X do X to Y? So if somebody comes to the door, should I actually tell the truth and say I'm hiding somebody in the attic? We over and over again talk about this. Mm -hmm. And that means, unfortunately, we may actually neglect some of the more social dimensions of ethics. Now, there's cosmopolitan ethics where people talk about global fairness and, and rights. But I'm actually, and I don't have the answer to the question, but I'm actually really profoundly interested in the question of whether if you rescale ethics, 
whether it becomes something quite different. So some big historians, for instance, say if you take a bigger scale on human, uh, the human story as part of... That, I thought if it was a bigger scale, it wouldn't just be human. It would oh, be completely. vertebrate. Well, so we'll, we'll get there. We'll get there. But right. the first step is if I take a bigger scale, then I might, for instance, I, I don't just see human to human interaction. I actually see environmental change. Mm -hmm. It comes into view. Then there's a question if I go beyond the human scale and I'm looking at that 13.8 million, what billion years, what is, what is the ethical story in there? Now, unfortunately, this is actually not a question that's been well trodden uh, in my field. And I think actually this is one of the most important things we could put our mind to, to help Stephen Hawking and you guys, he's rest in peace, but to help you think about and be prepared for that alien encounter should it happen. A lot of physicists are trained to just avoid thinking about being a human being. They just mm -hmm. think about, you know, object, you know, non-life, you know, stars, mm -hmm. not living or something. And uh, so, and I'm curious about, if you talk about ethics and getting bigger and bigger and bigger, are you always, ethics is about the study of the well-being of humans usually, right? Mm -hmm. And you're saying it's, it's the well-being of something larger than humans. Is that what you mm -hmm. said? Yes, I am. Okay, so like a planet. Yes, it is. Now, E.O. Wilson thinks that we should make half the planet of a big park and, and then we should preserve these other species because otherwise we're going to kill them all. Do you think that's what we should do? I, I actually, as I said to you earlier, I don't think we should be taking decisions in isolation. You know, you go over there and put the fence behind you. I actually think a lot of the things we do are system. So you think we're taking decisions? Then? We do take decisions that actually have implications that are well beyond the footprint of our species.